So I sent these questions ahead of time just to give everybody a, kind of an idea of what I would ask. I, I want to ask Reverend Rose to start off uh, and talk a little bit about the importance you place on voting and what it, some of your experience or some of your knowledge about voter suppression. You also told me I had about three minutes to say something before. That's what I'm going to do. There was a, um, a doctor who um, had become extremely wealthy and he <clears throat> sent his mother a pair of keys uh, for Christmas as a gift. His mother got it, but he didn't call him or say anything and he got a little concerned. So at Christmas time, he uh, called his mother and he said to his mother, did you get the gift that I sent you? She said, yes, son, it was a little small to go around. We cooked it last night. <laughs> and he said, Mama, you cooked a $5,000 pair of keys that could speak nine languages. She said, well, you should have said something. <laughs> so beginning so tonight and all this month, we're going to say something. We're going to say something because in my own life and during my lifetime, too many blacks and whites have suffered, have bled, have been beaten, and have died simply for the right to vote. And the right to vote is the preserve of all other rights. If you don't have the right to vote, you don't have freedom of speech, you don't have freedom of the press, you don't have freedom of anything. You can't serve on juries if you don't have the right vote. The right to vote is the preserver of all other rights. Medgar Evers was killed because of the right to vote. Uh, a preacher named George Lee died on the steps of his church in Arizona, Mississippi, fighting for the right to vote. Uh, Valda Luzo died on a highway between Montgomery and Selma because she was taking a young black man back to his car because of the right to vote. And, and I could go on and on with this, but blacks and whites have died all over this country fighting for the rights of some people to vote. And so we're going to do that now. And I want to close with one other thing. Um, I um, remember um, hearing about uh, uh, a woman who walked into a, a novelty store when there was on the counter a, a um, in a cage. And she walked in. Uh, she wasn't the best looking woman in the world. Her hair was in disarray. Uh, there was as much lipstick and rouge on her jaw as it was on her lips. And her hat and dress didn't match. Her shoes and purse didn't go together. And the parrot looked at her and said, You ugly. You ugly. And he said, What did you say? He said, You ugly. She said, I don't have to take this. I spent too much money in this store. So she went up to the court and complained about what the parent had said. And, and uh, the parent said, oh, I am sorry, ma'am. I know you spent a lot of money in this store. But listen, uh, I'm going to take care of that. So he took the, the parent in the back room and told the parent, you don't talk to customers like that. If you do it again, I'm going to cover you up. You understand me? The parent didn't say anything. A couple of weeks later, he took the parent back out there, put the parent on the counter. And the woman walked back in the store. And the parrot looked at the clerk and looked at the woman. The woman looked at the parrot, looked at the clerk. The parrot looked at the clerk, looked at the woman, and then looked at the woman again and said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we've heard the issues. We've heard the candidates. We know what their, their positions are on these issues. And we know which one to vote for, because we know. Uh, Tom, uh, <laughs> these questions are for anybody, uh, but uh, just some examples of voter suppression that you're aware of historically or you know, contemporary examples. If you're black in the room, you know. <laughs> we went through a terrible time in our history because of voter suppression. That was a poll tax that we couldn't bear. That was one act that um, the people had to support. 
press in my vote and recently the Supreme Court of this country gutted the 1965 Voter Rights Act and we all know what, what that has meant and even though um, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union the, the Union and the NAACP, SCLC and other civil rights and human rights groups have been trying to get that all changed in several states and particularly in the states of Texas and Ohio but that state that's going on now mainly because once the Republican legislators took over in this country, they redrew the boundaries to make sure that everything favored them and did not favor the Democrats, primarily because in the Democratic Party is where most of the minority votes are. Governor, so Tom, can you follow up maybe a little bit with some other historical examples about voter suppression? Right, no, absolutely. Um, well, the, the, the most common historical way of voter suppression was slavery. Uh, and, of course, pseudo-Victorian gentility for women. Uh, we've never had uh, an election in this country where the majority of people voted. Um, so, historically speaking, women and minorities were always um, uh, excluded. But racial minorities uh, eventually did get the right to vote after the Civil War for a brief decade um, during Reconstruction. And during that period, uh, we had black representatives serve in both houses of Congress. We had in all the state houses in the South, we had a black governor in Louisiana, um, still the only black governor in the South, and only served for two months, but still, uh, there was progress. After Reconstruction was over, um, there was a move to try to get that ended. And they did it through several ways. They all happened through the Constitution, through state constitutions. The poll tax is a good one. That poll tax is one of the main ones. If you are a member of a population that has been kept artificially poor for 300 years and you have one dollar and it costs a dollar to vote, you're always going to choose feeding your family over paying that dollar for a vote. It's going to end up being wiped out by white people. Anyway, um, property qualifications were another one. You can't vote unless you own property. And again, if you've been kept artificially poor for 300 years, uh, the likelihood that you have been able to accrue property in a place where the powerful have always been against you is going to be unlikely, and so therefore you're not going to be able to vote. Uh, the, other, the other big one they did was the, the, the literacy test. The literacy test, and again, you have been, it was illegal in all the former Confederate states to teach slaves how to read, and so <coughs> if you have been kept artificially ignorant for 300 years and they have not created the black schools, then uh, that is certainly going to be a way to keep you from voting, and they do that in a bunch of different ways. But all of them require some form of reading and interpreting balance, and always in English. And so literacy tests not only serve to disqualify a lot of poor black voters, but they also serve to uh, uh, deny the right to vote to a lot of different immigrant groups, because all of those literacy tests were in English. It was always a way to kind of, any kind of minority group would be kind of aced out of the process. The other big way that uh, votes were suppressed, that doesn't get talked about as much, uh, is through the, the loophole in the 13th Amendment, the, the amendment to free the slaves. The one thing that uh, the 13th Amendment says is you're not allowed to keep people in bondage anymore, except, there's that big except, we actually have a larger population in bondage than we ever did during slavery, and that is, of course, if you have been convicted of a crime. And so, um, uh, the other way uh, that they were able to keep people from voting is to make up a bunch of fake crimes and just start arresting people in the South. They started a program called Convict Least that ended up killing a quarter of the people who were arrested. It was a version of slavery that actually had a higher death rate than slavery. It was just a massive, horrible thing. In each of those states, along with doing that, we don't think of that as a voting issue, but each of those states, when doing that, also passed a law that says if you've been convicted of a felony, you're not allowed to vote anymore. So all they had to do was figure out a way to convict you of something, and then they automatically took away your right to vote forever. Um, I, think, I think that is important because though those seem like vestiges of a bygone era, there are versions of all of those things still very much around. When you talk about requiring an ID, that is a property qualification. That is requiring somebody to own something to be able to vote. When you are disallowing people who have been in jail from voting, you are essentially reviving the same process from Jim Crow era 1890s convict lease. And so, um, though, though there has been, you know, those official policies have been X'd out over the years, and 
women were able to vote in, in, in 1920, of course, and a lot of these things, and immigrants have had their votes taken away and given back several times, depending on when it was in the 20th century with the World Wars and things like that. For the most part, we like to think we've made some kind of progress in that area, but all of the various ways that um, we deny people the right to vote today are still basically the way we've been denying people the right to vote since the 1880s and 1890. So it is an historical pattern that has not gone away. If I could piggyback on what you're saying, I'm, I'm a, I printed these sheets out and uh, came across some data. There's clear evidence that state felony disenfranch disenfranchisement laws have had a disparate impact on African Americans and other minority groups. At present, 7.7% at present, of the adult African American population, or one out of every 13, is disenfranchised because of these laws. This rate is four times greater than non-African American population. So, okay, hang on. That's true, and, and you know, they always said the convict lease was for convicts, but 90% of the convicts that were leased were, were black, and so, um, it's, it's a way to, to create a mindset that says convicts are, are a phenomenon that, are, that is non-racial when clearly we know better than that and it's a way to kind of cover up what you're doing. Just like grandfather clause has covered up that poll tax so long ago uh, to make uh, illiterate, non-property owning white people able to vote and to get around all of those things in the first place. Anybody else have anything about historical Disenfranchisement. Well, I don't want to talk so much about the historical aspect, but I guess it ties in with part of modern history, and that is that uh, in spite of uh, voter suppression and intimidation of the past and the bygone era, uh, I'm supposed to be in Gordon tonight uh, with Mary Ann Whippleloo, who is uh, being fought every step of the way since January 2014, they trying to remove her from office. So it, 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 it is kind of as if though, even if you vote and, and, and exercise that right, there is still a system to remove you from office although you were elected by a majority vote. Uh, just to be brief, the same thing that we saw in Quitman with the Quitman 10 plus 2, which was to intimidate the people, to suppress the vote, to instill fear in blacks, that was the case with the Quitman 10 plus 2. I, I followed that case, then I was called the Madison, Florida. The same thing, voter suppression and voter intimidation. And of course, most of the Madison 9 people were all exonerated. All 12 of the Quitman 10 were exonerated. All 119 violations was dropped by the state of Georgia. Then I was called to Meg's Georgia. They didn't have a problem so much with voter suppression as have already been stated here this evening. But what they wanted to do, they wanted to remove her from office for the same reason, to be brief, and I'm gonna call these places, then I'm gonna pass the mic. The same thing happened with the equipment team that you all are familiar with. It happened in Meigs, Georgia. It's happened in Lumpkin, Georgia. It's happened in Dawson, Georgia. It happened in Davisboro, Georgia. It's happened in Warrington, Georgia. It's happened in Gordon, Georgia. It's happened in uh, Hancock County with the voting system that is a total disgrace. And, uh, and so even if and when you vote and put the person in office, there's still a system to remove them from office. And in many cases, it's the city attorney, it's other people in these cities does not want blacks in power. And, I have, and by me covering all the cities plus more that I have mentioned, there are two white ladies that call me as well, and they too. The good old boy system does not want them in power because their question is surrounding where is the money? I just want to add something to the equipment 10 plus 2. That investigation was started when on election day over 300 people went to vote and it was marked that they had already voted. When, they went, when the investigators got there, which they should have, that's very appropriate, if it were my vote, I'd be highly upset. Uh, there were paper ballots in place for those people, and those people swore affidavits that they did not vote those paper ballots. That's what started that investigation. What stopped the process, they tried one person after several mistrials. Uh, that was not upheld. That person walked away. They said, you know, we can't prove this. Secretary Kemp, on his own motion, decided not to try the rest of it. That was his choice. 
but it was started by protecting the vote. If I could, let me just add a little something to that. That's, that's partially true. I was there and I watched the whole thing. And they proved absolutely nothing except what we had said in the beginning. It was a joke. It was wrong. And they, they, they wanted these people, they didn't want these black people to be in charge of the largest corporation and the, the, uh, the largest corporation in Brooks County. That's all that was about. And once once they got into the trial, we sat there and I watched people lie and lie and lie and lie. And, lie. and, and thanks to that judge, that judge, he stood there and watched that. And finally, he made the ultimate decision to let it go. Now, I met with the district attorney here in Valdosta, and um, I suggested to him, I said, why don't you just stop? Stop it. You and I both know what's wrong. Just stop it. Well, he said, well, I can't stop it, but he gave me the name of the man in Atlanta. I called the man in Atlanta. He said, thank you for calling, but we have already decided to stop it, and they stopped it. If I may, I'm angry over the way the equipment 10 plus 2 was treated. And I can honestly say that District Attorney David Miller failed in his responsibility as a district attorney. I'm not making an accusation. This is something that was proven in the courtroom. Moreover, the GBI, the Secretary of State investigator, Glenn Archer in particular, lied on the stand. I'm asking you all to go to Boston GBR because all I see, it, to me, they didn't do it to protect the vote. Kind of disagree with you on that. They did it because for the first time in Brooks County, blacks held a majority on Brooks County, Brooks County Board of Education and they didn't like it. And therefore they started out to do what they did. But they was exonerated of all of these charges. Now look, people don't mention that the postal clerk at the U.S. Post Office lied on the stand from the foundation. The former school attorney, Dick, Mitchell, Dick Mitchell, went out and hired a private investigator to spy on them. And in addition to that, a sitting board member, Cunningham, donated $100 to that investigator. That postal clerk took those ballots, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, the ballots, and took information off it and passed it to that private investigator, which was official mail. So the question was, we asked, I asked on my YouTube channel, why haven't something been done to that individual? Wait one second. Y'all give me one more. Then the registrar, can y'all imagine this? The registrar took ballots from the place that was secured by the county to her home to process. She deputized her granddaughter and others to process those ballots. Now, if you can do that, then that means, in my opinion, you can take them down to your fish pond and have your friends to deal with those ballots. So we can, it, it's obvious. Now, I'm asking you all to don't take my word for what happened. I'm the one who documented, thank God for that, because the news media wouldn't cover it a day of that 19-day trial with Lula Smart. Not one newspaper, not one television station, nobody covered that trial but me. And I'm on rest now, y'all, excuse me. I can't address lying on the stand or anything like that. I wasn't there. Um, and I don't doubt that. But what I can tell you is that if the office had done what they were supposed to do, this would have never happened, period. Uh, the entire office was removed. I assisted them in replacing the entire staff and getting the office straight. And you've got a really good team over there now. That will never happen again. If I could, uh, thank you. Uh, the issue of gerrymandering. Uh, I think it's something we would all agree is very problematic across the country. Um, for those